Good morning, Sawyer. How are you? I'm um, well. How are you? Great. So today we're going to talk about uh, the big news that we were ISO 27001 and 27701 certified. Um, and since we do a ton of these implementations for clients and we finally got our own certification, decided to go through that process, uh, we really just wanted to share our journey and, and what it was like to become ISO 27001 certified, how we implemented the program, what the certification experience itself was like, um, really in hopes that it helps others that are trying to go through the same journey. Um, so just in way of quick introductions, my name is Christian Hyde. I'm a managing director at RISC 360. Um, along with Sawyer, I help lead our ISO 27001 practice where we help organizations uh, do implementations and internal audits and consulting around ISO. Sawyer? Yep, I'm a manager at RISC 360. Uh, as Christian said, I, I uh, help oversee the ISO service line. Um, so I work a lot uh, with clients on those internal audits, those implementations. Um, so I see a bunch of different, um, let's say, flavors of, of ISO implementation. Uh, so naturally, I was uh, I was uh, helping a lot with our um, ISO certification process internally. Yeah, so just for context, for, for anyone who's watching this and isn't mm -hmm. familiar with RISC 360, um, so part of what we do as an organization um, is help organizations become ISO certified. And we also do a lot of different certifications ourselves as an auditor. So we decided to undergo the certification process for our organization uh, around the consulting services that we do and around the platform that we have that helps us support implementation called Phalanx. Um, so in short, we, we followed our own process. So uh, what we're going to speak to here is the process that we would take any client through that we followed ourselves just to validate that it was effective. So we break this up into two processes. So first, when, when you're thinking about ISO certification, there's the implementation process, so the process of becoming compliant. Um, and then there's also the certification process itself when you're working with the external auditor to be certified. So we'll talk through both of those. So first we have our implementation process. Um, and the first thing you and I saw your kind of talk through when we talked through with anybody is, you know, we got to have a scope and a plan. So ISO is a nuanced framework in that you can have a big scope and cover your whole organization. You can have a small scope that over only covers an application. And we really chose for ourselves to cover what was most relevant to our clients. And that's what we advise most clients to. So we covered the consulting services that we do, as well as, like I said, our platform failings. And we were very specific about that. We um, we covered the, uh, what systems that would include, the people that would include, we documented all of that, and then we had to fill out an application letter eventually during the certification process that um, would do that. Um, and then once we have our scope, which in our case was our whole organization, we did a current state assessment. Um, so you want to talk a little bit about like kind of our current state assessment process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of the current state assessment, um, <clears throat> we basically performed um, an internal audit uh, ourselves against our own program. Um, once we decided the scope of uh, the, the ISMS. Uh, so what we did is we went through and we basically took the ISO 27001 uh, and 27701 frameworks and uh, we, we measured ourselves against it. I mean, this is what we do for clients. Um, and we, we determined where we fell short on control implementations and we basically developed um, you know, a, a set of gaps, um, so to speak, against the ISO frameworks. Um, and we took those plans or I'm sorry, those gaps to uh, the appropriate parties and we developed plans around how to get those aligned with ISO. Yeah, and so what that looks like for us is we said, hey, we're <laughs> missing policies. Uh, we were missing technical controls uh, that are required by the standard. Took each policy, then assigned an owner, and then that owner would commit to a due date to ultimately get that resolved. And that's what became our remediation roadmap. I, I, full disclosure on this is we have a huge advantage because we are ISO experts, so we were able to to do a pretty thorough gap assessment on ourselves. This is where most most people I think bring in a third party to help with that, because if you don't have the in-house expertise that has intimate knowledge of the ISO framework, you might need to do that. Obviously, because we're experts in the area, we, would, we were able to do that ourselves. Um, which really bled into, like I said, our, our remediation roadmap, or sometimes we call it maturity roadmap, uh, where we put a timeline together that I'll share with you guys in just a second for how we're going to implement this program, when we plan to get it done, uh, and then we can manage against that. So if we had dates, lines in the sand for each kind of item that we want to get corrected, we could follow up with the relevant parties to make sure that's on track. And that's really what we use as a project management framework um, during the implementation timeline. 
and then we put pen to paper. We go do it. That's program implementation where we're writing policies, we're implementing controls. Uh, Sawyer, you and I, I think, wrote a uh, lion's share of the policies, trained the team on them, rolled them out. Others definitely contributed. Uh, Shane on our team rolled out endpoint device management. Um, we have someone who did uh, a lot of our kind of network management. Uh, and uh, Lance, who's our uh, engineering team did a lot of the phalanx stuff where he was kind of taking corrective action so it was really a team effort on the implementation front but uh you myself and our ops manager really had to follow up diligently uh to make sure everything was on track things were going as expected and to check in it to make sure it was right yeah um, much like with our clients i mean you know we all have our, our our day jobs on top of the uh decision to implement iso um, and so it's it's important to make sure that this is uh, you know budgeted for in terms of time uh, because it does it does take some effort right I mean even us who like you said we're we're you know ISO experts we do this stuff day in and day out um, we we still found gaps with our program and uh, we still had to allocate some resources to uh, to close those gaps and you know it's important too to to make sure that you're calling out gaps. Um, and you're developing action plans that are reasonable too. That's what I love about ISO is that it can be right sized to an organization um, because I, I, I fear that a lot of organizations are going through what they consider an internal audit and they're coming up with a gap list that's a mile long. It seems impossible, um, but it might not necessarily reflect what the reality is of what they would need to do to truly get ISO certified. Yeah, so we have the big advantage too. We have this platform phalanx where we execute our internal audit um, where we would track any uh, identified gaps, put them in a risk register. We'd work together to risk rank those, prioritize them, assign action items and owners. And that really enabled us to, to prioritize things and track them all the way through to remediation. And I think it's very difficult for organizations to do that because we didn't start from zero, but we still had probably 20 or 30 gaps that we had to get through. Yeah. And that's a pretty significant project management effort just to <laughs> see that stuff through with quality. And and to treat it in a way where it's not just a check the box, where you're actually building a decent security program that fits your organization. So it took quite a lot of effort. Um, for us, I, again, we didn't start from zero. One, we had some program elements in place, uh, and two, we're experts in this. And it still took us the better part of a year to get through it um, because it was a shared responsibility when we were doing this as a team. So I would say that we started probably in the, the March or April time frame. That's when we began to do planning. We did our current state assessment through uh, May and June. And that's when we developed our remediation roadmap. And then we did the heart of our implementation work uh, from July to October. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the certification process itself. But the certification process lasted about two and a half months. So from October to December was when we went through the certification audit itself. Um, and it ended up getting our certification in hand in December. Yeah. Um, so, so we did have a lot of challenges. So uh, I think our challenges are indicative of anyone's challenges. So I wanted to highlight those. And, and if you're thinking about going through ISO certification yourself, what are some of the biggest things that uh, you went through? So I'll, I'll pull a couple of these out. Sawyer, and I'd love for you to expand on them. But um, my my main role was really decision making. So like um, there's this thing in ISO called an ISMS document. That's called an information security management system. And that's kind of a, a nuance to ISO where they make you define how you plan on managing security at your organization. Um, it's clause four through 10 in ISO. And I, I, I authored that for the most part. Um, I helped with the governance structure. So we have an information risk council. I helped lead a lot of the policy writing. But um, that was a huge lift for us because I think we wrote, I think there's about 30 policies um, that, that we have referenced, um, which is quite a lot. And, and that's, I would say, average. That's not a lot. That's probably an average number of policies that we had to write as an organization. Um, and, and that was challenging because it was just a lot of documentation. And it was a lot of thoughtful documentation uh, where we were trying to write stuff in a right sized approach for us that also met the spirit and intent of ISO 27001. And that was a huge lift. Um, so I know you participated a lot when it came to uh, like the current state assessment, the risk assessment. You want to talk through some of those challenges that you saw? The risk assessment was uh, also, you know, it, it I don't want to say it was a big lift, um, but it was something that uh, to Christian's point, it just took a lot of mental energy, right? It took a lot of mental energy to sit down and think through from a risk perspective, 
Uh, what are the items that are important for us to capture as an organization? Uh, because that risk assessment is something that I think if an organization does a risk assessment to check the box, um, they've missed out on probably the biggest piece of business value in the ISO framework. Um, yeah, it the definitely guided like how we decided to do things. Absolutely. Like employment device management, how we decided to do business continuity, some of the asset Absolutely. lists. I mean, it really impacted how we did the business. So it was That's very right. Yeah, we, we went into the risk assessment with a certain idea in mind based on the internal audit action plans of what we were going to do, where we were going to spend money, where we were going to invest time and resources. Um, and, and a lot of that stuck just because we had good kind of gut feelings going into it. But a lot of it changed after we did the risk assessment, because once you actually score these things and you rank them based on their risk and their impact to the organization, their likelihood to impact your organization, um, and you actually get a, a prioritized list down, uh, you, you start to change you know, what you're going to work on first um, and also what you're going to put resources towards, because every business has risk. Every business has risk. That's why we make money, right? Risk and reward. Um, but what risk you're going to mitigate or treat in some way um, is what that risk assessment process uh, bubbles up to the top and gives you clear visibility on. Yeah, I'll give you a good example. Like there were some items that required budgetary approval for us. For example, we rolled out some endpoint device management tools. Uh, we uh, rolled out some new AWS tools. And, um, you know, ultimately the, you guys had to roll a budget and a justification up to our executive team, which is me and, and CW in our case. And that risk assessment helped justify it. It said, hey, look, this is the risk we're taking on. Here's the budget to reduce that risk. And here's why we believe you should t undertake that. And we ultimately made decisions on on budgets because of that. So it was a huge thing. Um, yeah. A couple things I want to point out that I think are challenges for many organizations going through this and also maybe surprising. So in addition to the ISO um, certification audit itself, there's at least two other third party assessments that you have to get along with the certification audit. And that's a surprise to many organizations. So one is your internal audit. The internal audit has to be independent from the from the people implementing the ISMS. So if you're if you're the security person at your organization, you can't also do the internal audit. And most organizations don't have an independent party that's qualified to do that. So you have to engage a third party like Risk 360 or others. Um, so just heads up, that's sometimes an extra cost or another third party you have to engage. The other one is penetration testing. A lot of times you have to engage a third party to do penetration testing because you don't have those skills in house. Um, so that that comes as a surprise for a lot of organizations. And then there's other stuff that takes a lot of subject matter expertise. Like if you don't have a vulnerability management program, you might have to get somebody to help you think through how to do that. If you don't know how to do business continuity or incident response, you're, you're either gonna have to try to pull that together yourself or engage a third party to help with it. So there's just a large scope and breadth of, I think, things that you have to do to become ISO certified. And you either have to pull resources, identify and pull resources internally to get that done, or you have to go find a subject matter expert external to your firm to do that. And then keep in mind, at least two of the work streams, the internal audit and the pen test, you're probably going to have to allocate some budget to get those done externally, um, which was a surprise, but it's just that hidden cost of becoming certified that a lot of organizations don't take into account. Uh, so so bottom line is we, we got through implementation. It took us you know, probably six months yeah. or so to, to get through that. Uh, we, we got everything in place, and that's when we engaged the external auditor, uh, a partner of ours that we trust. They did a fantastic job. We're very happy with them. Um, and we were like, all right, let's go through the formal certification process. Um, so you want to kind of talk us through at a high level yeah. what the certification process with an external auditor looks like? Yeah, sure. So um, just as it does with the implementation uh, slide that we showed earlier, um, this process starts with planning and scoping, and this is where scoping is literally nailed down to a T. Um, they create a scope statement as a part of your client application form, um, and they help you, you know, talk through exactly what's in scope in terms of teams, products, uh, departments, whatever it is. Um, we also planned uh, planned out several different things, such as the dates for the stage one audit, stage two audit. Uh, also, the um, you know different system components we were going to be auditing. So we, we all, all that to say, we basically equip the external auditor during planning and scoping uh, with the tools they need to know what they're going to be auditing coming into that stage one audit. 
Yeah, there's um, a couple, just to point out, there's a couple pieces of admin documents that always come up uh, when it comes to the certification process. So the external auditor is going to require that you fill out an application letter. They're also going to require that you complete something called a statement of applicability. So those are fairly robust uh, documents that take some time to think through that is required for the external auditor to perform scoping. So just heads up, those are admin documents you got to fill out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the, the stage one audit was, uh, it was essentially an audit of clauses four through 10. Um, this is where um, the external auditor gains comfort that your um, implementation of really the heart of ISO, which is that governance structure is in place. It's in, and it's ready uh, to be, you know, further audited, right? Um, a lot of companies attack the control list first, which is Annex A or 27002. Those are both uh, somewhat synonymous with each other, um, but it's all those granular controls. Um, that's really what comes into play in the stage two audit. Um, but arguably, if you if you look at the spirit of ISO, you can effectively implement those controls without your ISMS or your clause four through 10 uh, requirements. And so that's where they spend a lot of time in the stage one audit. And they really hone in on literally each and every bullet point in the standard. So if you're trying to do this and you don't have the standard, um, you're you're already uh, at a yeah. disadvantage. I would 100% say that because I think when a lot of people think of ISO 27001, they immediately think about all the controls, like all the technical stuff you're supposed yeah. to implement, which is called Annex A. But 100% download the framework because the part that no one talks about is the governance structure, which is clause four through 10. It's like the first 10 or 15 pages of the framework. And that is the whole governance structure. That's probably the thing that's audited the hardest by the certification auditor. And um, it's that's, like you said, done mostly in stage one. Um, I also say that the stage one audit, in my opinion, having worked with many audit firms, because each one takes a slightly different approach, is kind of the kick the tires audit. Because they'll look at high risk stuff sometimes. They'll look at, did you do a risk assessment? Do you have policies in place? Do they feel like you're going to be successful for a stage two audit? Yeah. Because if you're too far behind, they might just say, look, we need to move this out. We need to start over. You're not ready to do it. Um, but what they're looking for is they feel comfortable that there's enough structure in place that you're going to be successful during a stage two, or at least that you have a good shot at it. Yeah. And an important note here, um, and this is a double edged sword is that what uh, any kind of uh, issues that come up during the stage one audit um, are not noted as gaps in your final report. Um, you actually have between the time of stage one and stage two to remediate any kind of issues that may have come up. Um, but that can be um, a detriment because if you if you adopt that mindset early on and you think, well, we'll just get you know what we can done and just see where stage one leaves us. Um, one of one of really two things can happen. One, um, they decide that you're not ready for stage two um, and they will not recommend that you continue in the process. And that can be wasted, uh, wasted money, wasted budget, uh, time, all that stuff, um, not to mention delayed certification. Or you get some gaps in stage one that are really big efforts, right? Like I've seen uh, I've seen companies that just uh, have not done uh, an internal audit. Um, and they go into the stage one audit and the external auditor says, well, you need a stage one audit or I'm sorry, you need an internal audit done prior to stage two. Um, and that's a really big effort. It takes a lot of time and it's it's really difficult to even if you have the internal folks to get them uh, on board and, and everything lined up. If you don't have the internal folks to go source an external uh, party to do that and to allocate the time needed to uh, focus on that effort appropriately. Um, it can be a big deal. So I encourage you to make sure that you're you're approaching stage one audits with uh, the goal in mind of, you know, scoring a 100 on that test, because that's going to keep you from uh, fighting fires between stage one and stage two. Yep. And just a bit just for for clarity on timeline here. So typically you do planning and scoping. Uh, as, as early as you want, and they'll schedule a stage one audit. They'll do a stage one audit. The stage one audit is always a little bit lighter. It's typically one or two days. Um, a, a lot of times they'll do it remote. Sometimes it's on site. It just depends. Um, and then usually within 45 days, typically between 30 and 45 days after stage one, they will do stage two audit. So it's, a, it's not a long time between audits. It's pretty quick. So if you're remediating gaps, that's an issue. So then you do stage two audit. Like I said, between 30 and 45 days after stage one. Stage two is typically a week or so in duration. It's, it's intensive. There's a ton of artifacts that you have to gather as evidence for the auditor. 
And then usually about 30 days after that is when you get certification in hand. So between stage one and certification in hand, it's typically 75 to 90 days. So you know between two and three months to get that process underway. So as you can kind of see in our timeline that we put together over here in the right hand side, you know, we had to budget basically two and a half months uh, for the certification audit itself. Stage one, 30 days later doing stage two, and then by the end of December having a report in hand. So if you're communicating those commitments off to your clients and telling them that you're going to have a certain hand by a certain date, you need to do some backwards planning and account for about two and a half months of certification yeah. time. That's stage one. So can you talk about like what did the stage two audit feel like? Like what was the blocking and tackling? Um, with the auditor? Yeah, it was um, it, it was really just a ton of evidence submission up front. Um, and then it was a discussion um, on each of the in scope controls. Um, yeah. So basically the the control, you know, would um, state that you had to do X, Y, Z or there's, you know, um, certain things that uh, the company should be doing with regards to, let's say, access control. Um, the external auditor will um, look at the evidence that you've submitted um, to address that control, um, and then they'll come back at you with questions. It's very conversational, um, but it is in depth. I mean, it's it's literally you know looking at point the by point. yeah point by point the the tactics of how you've implemented a control. Um, you may have other team members that need to jump on the phone on an ad hoc basis. Um, you know, there's obviously some professionalism in the scheduling there. Um, they can jump on when they can type thing. But the point is, this is uh, kind of an all hands on deck type uh, exercise uh, because the external auditors allocated a certain week typically of when they're going to do your audit. And it's really important that you try to, um, you know, do your best to give them what they need uh, when they ask for it, because that's going to help everyone. Right? It's going to keep you from having a delayed certification. Um, it's going to help them uh, get through things in a timely manner. Um, and and then anything that they find in the stage two audit, um, because it's a point in time audit, um, typically, unless it's just a misunderstanding of the implementation, um, if it's something they note as a gap at that point, um, that is something that will wind up in the external um, report that comes at the end. Um, yeah, it's so not something. Go ahead. I was just going to say in way of prep, like, I know that before the stage one and stage two, I, I would say we spent a few days uploading evidence because they gave us an information request list, a couple hundred audit artifacts, I guess, and we had to go through all of our systems, pull those. We had to uh, work with engineering to get screenshots of access lists and configuration settings. We had to pull policies. Um, we had to work with uh, CW to some of our HR stuff to pull like background checks to prove that we did that. So we really had to coordinate across the team to pull down evidence, provide it to the auditor. We had to interpret sometimes what the world the auditor was actually even wanting because their their request would be a little bit ambiguous. And yeah. it's not because the auditor did a bad job. That's just typical, you know. Um, well, yeah, clear right. That's, clear. that's what I was going to say. The, the external auditor does not know, you know, everything about your systems coming into the audit. I mean, they've, you know, they, they familiarize themselves as much as they, they possibly can, uh, but sometimes they rely on you to help understand the control and provide the appropriate evidence. And that's what I was going to say is, was a huge benefit for us here is by leveraging our tool failings, by leveraging the expertise that we have in the ISO uh, frameworks during that internal audit, um, because the internal audit was like six months before this, we weren't able to necessarily reuse a lot of that evidence, but I did know exactly what needed to be captured or recaptured uh, to provide as fresh evidence for the external auditor by just simply going into phalanx, looking at the relevant link control and see, you know, seeing the screenshot that we provided there and saying, hey, uh, Lance, you know, can you get me this same screenshot? He's like, oh yeah, I know where that is. That's in this system. That's XYZ. Um, versus me trying to articulate to him what the control means and what he could get and what, uh, you know. So so there was a lot of uh, ambiguity that was removed by just simply referencing that internal audit exercise. And that's one of the biggest value adds to, in my mind to a business of doing an internal audit, right? Yeah. Um, so we provided all that evidence and then we sat through walkthroughs. So, um, you know, we spent, I don't know, countless hours gathering evidence, providing it, um, necessary part of the audit. Then we spent, you know, several days uh, between me and you, or you and other teammates, just covering every single control point by point. Then pulling up the evidence, interpreting the evidence, and us explaining how we had implemented the control. 
uh, and it was it was laborious, and, and that's the nature of an audit, right? They need to be thorough. Um, we, we picked a thorough audit from for that reason. Um, so it was a big lift. That's the bottom line. It, it uh, distracted a lot of team members. It commandeered our time for a couple weeks. Um, obviously, I believe it was worth it um, to be able to prove out that the, um, you know, we eat our own dog food and, and became certified. But if you were planning your own journey, you know, you need to be prepared for that. There's a whole lot that goes into that certification audit. It's not a walk in the park. Um, I think we've already covered a lot of certification challenges. I think we went through like five full days of, of walkthroughs, I guess it was. And, and we're a small firm too. So the number of days is typically driven by how complex your scope is, how big the organization is. We were on the smaller end. So we actually had three auditors on the phone uh, auditing us for about five full days. So it was quite extensive. They were kind of beating us up a little bit, which was great, uh, you know, because we were going back and forth on the stuff. Uh, we had to we had to really think through and justify why we took certain approaches, and it, I think it came out really well in the end. Um, I think we provided about 150 audit artifacts. We talked about that, how, how that went. And the other thing is, you, you alluded to this earlier, is uh, you need to download the framework because yeah. auditors are very specific. Like you, you might have a, a 90 percent working knowledge of basically what ISO needs you to do, but the auditor is going to go down point by point by point. So I know in some of the clauses like uh, clause 6.2 is one that I always remember and there's clause 6.2, but then there's sub points A through like J and they went through A through J. Show me where you're doing this and this and this. And sometimes it was like a column in a spreadsheet, like that kind of detail. Like show yeah. me uh, in this case it was like who does it, when they do it, why they do it. And you have to have all of that documented. And if you don't have one of those things documented, they'll they'll note like what's called a minor nonconformity. It's not a showstopper. You can still get certified, but you know, it's still annoying <laughs> when you miss some small bullet point. Yeah. And that cost you have an issue on the audit uh, on your certification audit. Um, so download that, work your work your way through that, all of those stuff prioritize the big picture stuff, but also try to capture the sub bullet points along the way. And those are challenges because no one's perfect. And and just depending on how thorough the auditor wants to be, if they want to find something, they can almost always find something. So, um, yeah. you know, prioritize the biggest stuff to the top and uh, try not to sweat the small stuff, but be as thorough as you can. Those are some of the big certification challenges we had. Anything else, Sawyer, that you want to mention as far as challenges? No, I just, again, pr probably for a third time, just stressing those uh, sub bullet points. I mean, it's, you know, ISO has very specific language for very specific reasons. Um, so like if you see, for instance, uh, top management, know that that means literally top management, not, you know, the manager or the, you know, the senior manager over in that department. No, it means top management. So typically that's the executive C-level sponsor of the, the ISMS. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's really the, the key takeaway, I think, from this slide is, you know, it's, it's a laborious process and there are a lot of specifics. So allocate the appropriate resources to be successful. Yep. And when it comes to specifics, um, that's the ISO 27001 Learning Center. So Sawyer, myself, the rest of our team, if you need, we've, we've spent a lot of time putting these resources together. So if based on this, you think you need some additional help, you want to educate yourself, you want resources to help you get through ISO, to interpret ISO, um, we have at least two resources that I want to point you to. One is the ISO 27001 Learning Center. It's on the risk360.com website. You can go to the Learning Center link and, and it spells, it gives you the basics of ISO um, you know, at a high level. What is ISO? Why is it important? Answering questions. I think that's a great place to start your journey. Um, and there's also an ISO 27001 video series um, starting with the basics and, and Sawyer and I are going to go through clause by clause and talk about it's two to three minute videos where we talk about every aspect of ISO, what the type of evidence you need to collect are, what the audit feels like and go through the whole entire series. I think that's a very valuable resource um, that you can you can watch and, and get a lot of learning from. And we also have a, a lot of white papers. Um, so we have a, a, one I would recommend is there's a business case for ISO 27001. So if you're trying to justify that to a boss, why you want to become certified, that's a great one. There's a framework overview and there's a detailed certification process. So it's a lot of what we just talked about in written form, and you can definitely download those also off our website and the white papers page. Um, if you like this type of content, we have a YouTube channel uh, and we have an ISO 27001 video series. Check that out. 
Uh, me and another colleague do a um, a podcast every Tuesday called Tuesday Morning Grind. We talk about technical content, uh, uh, technical concepts, a lot of the ISO related, a lot of other stuff. And again, the website's a great resource. We have a ton of resources there for free. Um, so Sawyer, thanks for your time. Uh, I'm very proud of us for becoming certified. We're going to do yeah. another video uh, that that talks about how we did ISO 27701, which is the privacy tack on to 27001. We'll cover that separately. So if anyone out there is also considering that certification, check out our next video. I'll put a link to that and you can see how we uh, created what's called an integrated management system. So thanks, Sawyer. Yeah, thank you. Talk soon.